end of that pandemic and the resumption of in-person meetings. But we decided we had to do this now because uh, we had to do this virtually because science must go on much like the theater, the show must go on. And, um, and we've adapted to this situation over the last year and we've done very well. And you know, some, as we were talking about before with, with, with Harriet Cayley, uh, you know, some professions have even thrived with the ability to visit multiple countries sequentially all within 15 minutes to attend meetings and other special events. So we're, we've adapted and we're gonna take advantage of this. And we hope that next year's meeting will be, will be live once again, because there is much lost by not being able to do that. So uh, not to go on too long, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce several individuals who will speak briefly about this lecture and, and Dr. Cayley's legacy. The first of those people are Ed Messina. I'm then gonna talk, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Irv Zucker, and then I'm gonna introduce Dr. Harriet Cayley, and then Dr. Bellany finally will introduce our speaker, our honored speaker today. So uh, without further ado, Dr. Ed Messina is a professor emeritus of physiology. He was a student of Gabe's and he was a major contributor to the, in the selection committee of our awardees. And uh, I'd like to have him to say a few words, a few words, Ed, about, uh, about, about this lectureship, the importance of this lectureship and Dr. Cayley's legacy. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending and honoring the memory of Dr. Gabe Cayley, my teacher my, and my mentor and my friend, most importantly. Uh, I'd like to speak to his legacy with regards him being a teacher, mentor, and scientist. And I will uh, keep my remarks kind of brief if I can. Uh, Gay began his career at NYU under the tutelage of Benjamin Swyfock in the Department of Pathology. Uh, and then he moved to New York Medical College where he undertook the role of uh, associate professor, then eventually professor and acting chair of the department. Uh, it was at that time that I met Gabe, and I'd like to first speak about his uh, role as a teacher and mentor for myself personally. And for only those students that uh, remained close members of uh, what I like to call the Department of Physiology family. Gabe's mentorship of many, many students is well-renowned. Uh, many of them have become successes in industry and in pharmacy at the university and medical school level. To point out a few individuals, uh, the next speaker, Dr. Irv Zucker, was actually Gabe's first doctoral student. Uh, uh, Irv went on to Nebraska after graduation and eventually became professor and chairman of the Department of Physiology and Biophysics. And most notably in his career, he also became past president of the American Physiological Society and editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Physiology. I remained a, a, a hometown boy and stayed at New York Medical College and enjoyed the friendship of Gabe for many, many, many years. There are some other people that deserve mentioning, most particularly Tom Hinsey, who came to us originally uh, as a graduate student uh, and, then, and also as a technician originally, uh, and then eventually became the graduate student and under the mentorship of Gabe Cayley, uh, got his PhD degree and then took a postdoctoral fellowship with Steve Atner at Harvard. Uh, Tom then looked to come back home for personal reasons of family, and he uh, asked Gabe whether or not there could be a position for him. Gabe willingly took him on, knowing Tom's history for his work ethic and his nose for science. And so that's how Tom came to be a professor here and ultimately became past, president, past chairman of the Department of Physiology. So at least two students of Gabe became chairmen of the Department of Physiology. One of the other students that is a member of uh, the Gabor family and New York Medical College family is our own Dr. Dong Sun, who has become a remarkable scientist in his own right. And it's to that that, that we could all look to Gabe's influence as a leader, mentor, and teacher. And we are all beholding to him for his graciousness as our mentor and teacher. With regards to his science, I'd like to go back to the early days when he was at NYU. Gabe's major interest was in the renin angiotensin system. And his first uh, studies uh, evolved the evolution of the renin angiotensin system phylogenetically. And it was his paper that actually point out to the origins and its first appearance. 
Uh, when he moved to New York Medical College, uh, a very uh, fortuitous event took place in the basement laboratory in which he inhabited for many years. A representative from Upjohn Pharmaceuticals presented himself and said that he had some new compounds that Gabe might be interested in. And uh, th this gentleman uh, mentioned the prostaglandins. Uh, uh, Gabe knew the work of Von Euler, who in the early uh, part of the, 19th, uh, the, the 20th century, it was very fashionable for people to extract organs, uh, take the fluids and inject them into animals to see what kind of biological properties they had. Well, Von Euler, dis Von Euler discovered that the prostaglandins had some effects on both the heart and on blood vessels. So Gabe, with unbelievable instincts, knew immediately this was something he wanted to get into. And it's his early studies that dealt with the chemotaxis effect of prostaglandins and their ability to cause increased impermeability at the microcirculatory level that led John Vane to hypothesize that potentially aspirin was an inhibitor of prostaglandin synthesis. In fact, John Vane took note of that in several visits when he came to visit both John McGiff and Gabe in our laboratories here at New York Medical College. They became fast friends, and as a result of Gabe's contribution to, to John's hypothesis, which eventually uh, earned him the Nobel Prize, uh, Gabe was able to secure a sabbatical under John Vane and Salvatore Mercado, uh, Mercado at the uh, Welcome Institute where John Vane was the director and head. So that's just some of the legacy uh, of Gabe Cayley, both as a teacher, mentor, and his early career as a scientist. Gabe, all his students will tell you, he had an instinct as to where to go and what to do. And he was such a productive and effective scientist that his legacy will live on forever. And now I'm proud to introduce my friend and for a long time and my colleague, Dr. Irving Zucker. Thank you, Ed. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I hope it works. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, can you see that? Yes. I hope so. Yes. OK. Well, so I'm, I'm very honored to be asked to participate in this year's uh, uh, Cayley Lectureship. And uh, I'm so happy that, uh, that Harriet has continued the, uh, the legacy of, of, of funding this uh, lectureship. And um, uh, certainly the past speakers have been outstanding. And this year's uh, uh, lectureship awardee will be, I'm sure, up to, up to the job. I've known Virginia for a long time and I'm anxiously looking forward to her, her talk. I'll just be very brief. Um, as Ed already mentioned, I was um, Gabe's first graduate student. Uh, I came to New York Medical College in 1968 and I graduated in 1972. Four years is pretty good these days for a graduate student, but, uh, but uh, I'm glad I, I did that. And I, I was not planning to come out to Nebraska, but uh, you know how things happen. The person you want to work with sometimes move, moves. So Gabe to me was, um, was many things. He was certainly a mentor. Uh, and I learned a lot about science, about as Ed said, the intuition of science. I learned a, a lot about uh, how to treat people in science. Uh, and, and he was really quite a role model. He was also a colleague. I mean, we had talked about many types of science globally. <laughs> I remember back in those days, there was this idea that not, th there was no more to study, everything's been done. And of course, every time you uncovered a new fact that opened up more questions and Gabe was very attuned to that. And, and most importantly, Gabe was a friend and, uh, and we, uh, we traveled around the world together, sometimes following each other. We had a, a lot of great times and uh, I certainly will always miss that, but always cherish those moments. Uh, and and, and there's, a, there's an interesting quote that Steven Spielberg said, that the delicate balance of mentoring someone is not creating them in your own image but giving them the opportunity to create themselves. And I really thank uh, Gabe uh, so much for 
allowing me to find myself uh, in those early days when I was a graduate student in the lab. And I think uh, his encouragement for me to be somewhat multidisciplinary has really uh, helped me tremendously in my career. Um, Gabe visited us here in Nebraska after I was chair back 18 years ago now, a long time ago, and we presented him with a named lecture. Uh, uh, and, and he uh, he talked about the microcirculation. And one of the things Gabe always said is, uh, there are satisfactions derived through a long career in science that far outweigh what I imagine I would have accomplished as an MD. The pressures now in science are greater than ever. This remains so today. Remaining creative is a full-time job and I relish it. And I think Gabe really did enjoy science, enjoy the thinking about science, and he passed that along to all of his trainees. As my biochemistry teacher, Albert St. Georgie, who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine said, a good scientist has to see what everybody sees and think what nobody else has thought. And I think that idea uh, has permeated through all of Gabe's uh, interactions with people, other people, and especially his trainees. I know myself and Ed can attest to that. And, uh, and that has really been a thought process in my career for, for many, many years. Uh, a little bit about science. Uh, so um, this was my first paper uh, published in the American Journal of Physiology that I have a fondness for, as Ed mentioned. And, uh, and, and, and we did renal denervation in those days and we're still thinking about that today. So this was back in 1974. So it's amazing that the thread has continued on. But as, as Ed said, Gabe was well known for his studies on prostaglandins and thromboxane. But uh, in his latter part of his career, I always felt that some of his best work was done in the last 15 or 20 years and well known for studies on flow mediated dilation, along with Dong Sun and An, An Wang Akosh. Uh, at Tom Hintze also uh, did a, a myriad of studies that define the importance of nitric oxide mediated dilation in exercise, in aging, the role of oxidative stress, the role of angiotensin. And this was even before David Harrison's um, uh, discovery that, that angiotensin was mediated, the, the effects of angiotensin at the vascular level anyway, was mediated by their effects on NADPH oxidase and, 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 and superoxide formation. Uh, so the whole idea of shear, of, of, um, uh, of flow mediated dilation really can be attributed to many of the studies that, uh, that Gabe did uh, uh, later in his career, and I think this was a, a, a great contribution to science. The pictures that you see are, are at either EB meetings or the, uh, the physiology chairs meetings, uh, which I still remember with great fond fondness and look at these photos often. Uh, finally, I just want to, uh, to uh, say a few words. Um, uh, Zoltan Angvari made, made me aware of this book by Thomas Recho called The Reluctant Adventurer. Some of you may have read it. Some of you, if you haven't read it, I, I would refer it to you. It's, it's sort of a biography of the life of a bunch of friends, uh, including Gabe, that took place uh, during World War II in Hungary when these, uh, these kids at that age uh, in their 20s were, um, were sent to labor camps by the Nazis. And, uh, and this book recounts all the trials and tribulations they went through. And they talk about Gabe's contributions to their environment and to their, uh, and to their ability to get through those difficult times. And there's one passage in the book that I, um, I read and, and it reminds me so much of Gabe and my, my remembrances of Gabe. It says that weeks passed and we began to organize ourselves. Sometimes we started daydreaming out loud. Kasha, who was Gabe, would talk of future feasts. He would recite the menu out loud, a whole duck just for himself 
garnished with oranges and stuffed with chestnuts, coated with chocolate, decorated with whipped cream, and based with cognac. Every day he would add something to the recipe. And that reminds me so much of my interaction with Gabe. He, he, he really was lusted for life and he, um, and he enjoyed every moment. And we shared many, many meals and I know how much he had savored every moment. So I'm just gonna close with uh, one photo that I found that I think uh, is poignant at, at this moment. Uh, sorry, whoops. For some reason I can't get it on here, hold on. There. Wow. So this, uh, this, uh, this photo of Akos, Gabe, Tom Hintzian, and myself, on the occasion of an honorary degree, I think at Semmelweis University in, uh, in Budapest. So um, I have great remembrances. And I, again, I thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. Uh, let me say one word, uh, Chris. Very yeah. briefly, yes. Yes, just that, uh, you know, I still owe Gabe because he asked me to translate this book to Hungarian. And I haven't done it yet. <laughs> but I will do one day. We're going to hold you to that, Akos. Yes, and then make a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and David will help us. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Irv. Uh, Dr. Harriet Cayley, would you like to say a few words? I would. I would, thank though. You. I'm, a little, I'm a little choked up. I, I did prepare something. Uh, but I'm, I'm a little choked up at hearing all of this. This brings back the wonderful life that I had with Gabe so vividly. And so many of you were part of that life. And I'm so glad that you remember it so vividly and that it still has consequences in, in the world today. Um, I, I prepared some remarks and I'm going to have to read them because I don't think I can trust myself to speak extemporaneously now, but I, I'm very, very touched, very, very gratified. And I think Gabe would, would be very happy to know that he's had this kind of impact and that he's remembered in this way, you know, as, as, a, as a, a scientist, which would have meant the world to him. And as a person, I, I, you know, I think Gabe really enjoyed life, but I'm not sure he could have apprehended how, what a, what a salutary effect he had on the lives of a lot of people. He was a really good guy. <sighs> All right. So what I wrote, because we're here about the seventh annual Gabor Cayley, lecture, and that's how it's pronounced, Gabor. Kaylee is shortened, is anglicized for the unpronounceable to Americans of his name in Hungarian, which was Kolochoyi. And his name, when, he, when we first met, he made sure that I understood that his name was Kolochoyi Gabor. Uh, that's the way it's done in, in Hungarian. And, uh, um, uh, it, it became clear that no one could pronounce Kolochoyi. I, I, I had to pass a test before we could get married to, on, uh, with regard to pronunciation. So it got shortened to Kaylee uh, and we've been misidentified as a result of that ever since. Mostly as, uh, you know, Irish or relatives of the Paley family with a typo. Anyway, his name is, was Gabor Cayley. And I wanna tell you something about him. It, uh, my, my dear, dear husband was, despite my emphasis just now on how to say his name, he was Gabe, as you have heard, to everyone who knew him, w with the possible exception of an occasional new medical student who was too awed for such casualness. But, Gabe, you know, was a very 
friendly, open, accessible guy, except when he got, you know, when he wanted his will to predominate, he could be, he could be very dominant indeed, but he was, he was not truly a casual kind of person. Everything he did here in this department, in the medical school, in the process of science, he did with an intensity of commitment and devotion that amounted to ardor. He, but he did it all with his characteristic ebullient high spirits, a great sense of fun, an enormous capacity for friendship and humor and love. He, 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 he'd lived through and experienced some of the worst of the Holocaust in Hungary. I'm not sure that was clear. You know, the Holocaust is almost a century behind us. And we've all, some of it has become an historical event, but there was, there were still people alive to, who lived through it. And Gabe had, had lived through it. He lived through the worst of the Holocaust in Hungary. He was born and raised in, in Budapest. And the, the Holocaust, it did mark him, but it never scarred him, which I thought was really remarkable and, and wonderful. Uh, even his sister, who lived to be past 90 and was one of the people who was sent with his family. Gabe was in a slave labor camp, as you've told, been told. The rest of his family went on what has become known to history as the Kestner train. The only uh, promise that Eichmann ever kept was that he put together a train of about 1,700 Jews at the price of a kilo or two kilos of gold each. And he sent them to a special camp in Bergen-Belsen from which they were, they were released into Switzerland. The only promise that Eichmann ever kept and it was no picnic, but anyway, his sister who was on that, when I spoke to her about it on her 90th birthday and, and raised it, she said to me, but it didn't define me. That did not define me. And the Holocaust did not define Gabe either, but it taught him a lot about life and what was possible. Uh, he, one of his, it, it didn't scar him. He really was a very ebullient guy. Uh, one of his faculty once told me that Gabe's personal warmth, the creative unity that he forged in the department were why the physiology faculty regularly all ate lunch together in the departmental library. He, he had created an atmosphere that was not only tremendously productive, but had steely bonds of friendship. I think what, that we're here and that we've heard this from his friends and colleagues and students, I think testifies to that. One measure of what he accomplished was that he was the longest sitting chairman of any medical school department in the United States. He knew that couldn't have happened without a really supportive faculty, and it gave him very great satisfaction. Another measure of how deeply he cared about this department, about his work and about science, was that it was his fervent wish that we establish an ongoing process in his name that would continue his mission of teaching, informing, and educating. My son David and I were gratified that we, together with the leaders of this college and of the department, were able to fulfill Gabe's wish in the form of these lectures. And we're enormously proud and happy that it seems to be a going concern. And we, we, we like to think of it stretching far into the future. And it looks as though that's been set up. There is a structure for that. We joke to ourselves that one of the few good things about this pandemic is that it forces us to hold this lecture virtually, thus saving on costs while at the same time permitting everyone interested to attend no matter where they are. One other thing to joke about, and it is sort of a joke, but it's also serious. In the beginning, it looked from these, on the basis of these lectures as though scientists were always men. In recent years, we've fixed that. 
So it's very satisfying to have our speaker, Virginia Miller, here today, especially since the title of her talk seems so universally relevant. So I want to thank the, the planners of the program and welcome our speaker and thank all of you for being here for this event that is so dear to our hearts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harriet. That was lovely. And we truly appreciate your sentiment and hope to live up to it. Um, so I'd now like to introduce Dr. Frank Bellany to um, introduce our speaker today. And he will be short, I'm sure, because we're running a little long in this program. Well, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Dr. Leonard. Uh, I will be as tall as I am, although I'm getting shorter every year. Uh, uh, anyway, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Virginia Miller is Emer Emerita Professor of Surgery and Physiology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. <clears throat> her educational background uh, provided her with great foundational breadth. She earned a bachelor's degree in education and biology from Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania, an MBA from the University of Minnesota, and her PhD in physiology from the University of Missouri. So I met Virginia uh, a number of years ago. I won't tell you what that number is, but early on in our respective careers at the University of Virginia, where she was a postdoctoral fellow and then a visiting assistant professor in psychology, and I was a research assistant professor in physiology. After her time at UVA in Virginia, she went on to interim positions at the University of Delaware and at W.B. Sanders briefly, Sa Saunders, pardon me, briefly, before landing at the Mayo Foundation in Rochester, uh, originally working with Paul Van Huda, who some of you will know. Um, and that's where she has remained for the major portion of her very productive career. At Mayo, she, as I mentioned, an emerita professor of surgery and physiology, and for many years was director of the Women's Health Research Center. Uh, Dr. Miller has published hundreds of papers, reviews, and book chapters, and has delivered hundreds, really, of invited lectures all over the world. Her research began by studying temperature regulation in the marmot, not the varmint, but the marmot type of ground swirl, and then moved on to the study of endothelial dependent vasodilation, which many of you will recognize, and other endothelial functions. Gradually, she began to study the effects of hormones, including sex steroids on vascular function and sex differences in vascular function. And this interest evolved into her more recent work with both experimental animals and clinical studies that has focused on how sex steroids like estrogen and conditions um, and, uh, and, and conditions unique to women, such as pregnancy and menopause, affect cardiovascular health and cognition, which I believe is what she's gonna tell us about today. Dr. Miller has received numerous awards, including the Bernadine Healy Award for Visionary Leadership in Women's Health, the Women's Day Magazine Red Dress Award for her work in research and advocacy for women's health, and the Paul Van Huda named lecture in vascular pharmacology from the American Society for Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics. She has worked with international groups in the promotion for the inclusion of sex and gender variables in basic and medical curricula and research. In addition to service on various grant review panels and editorial boards for various scientific journals, she served as a member of the governing council for the American Physiological Society and as president of the Organization for the Study of Sex Differences. So because of her longtime friendship with so many of us in the department, like myself, Carl Thompson, Mike Wolin, Akush, Cole Messina, Pam Lucchese, and of course, Dr. Cayley, and especially because of her outstanding contributions to cardiovascular science, we are most pleased and honored to welcome Dr. Miller as our seventh annual Dr. Gabor and Harriet Cayley Endowed Lecturer, who will speak to us today in the few minutes remaining on our schedule on sex hormones and 
cardiovascular disease. So Virginia, the virtual podium is yours. Well, thank you very much for this kind introduction. It is indeed an honor for me to participate in this lecture today. As uh, Frank mentioned, I had known Gabor since about 1983 when I came to Paul Van Huda's lab and our, my work with the endothelium and his interest in it overlapped. And we had many um, chances over the years to engage in conferences and papers and so on. And I had visited uh, Bauhaus at Medical College several times to give talks. And he, at one point actually offered me a position and due to my family circumstances at the time, I wasn't able to accept that. And I think, you know, uh, my career took a very different turn. It would have taken a very different turn had I come to New York compared to stay at Mayo. My scientific credentials aren't nearly as prestigious as Gabe's, but I always enjoyed his interactions. I'd look for him at the editor's meeting always to, to um, join him at the, at the table for dinner because he was such an interesting man. And indeed, he was a good man, very kind, outspoken uh, with his opinions, but kind and uh, a role model for us all and how to be a gentleman, I think is, I would say, very, uh, I valued his friendship a lot. So I, with those comments, I guess I should present, start my talk. So this maybe is the right one to share, share. Can everybody see it okay? Yes. Okay. So um, I'll just show you my funding sources and conflict of interest in case there's anybody watching that needs uh, CME credit for that. This is something that became ingrained at me at Mayo Clinic. We always start our talks with that. But I have some learning objections, objectives for you today, and they're simple. First of all, I just really like to review for everybody to bring everybody up to the same point factors that contribute to sex differences in physiology. And then really see by the end, if you can come up with at least three processes that influence sex differences in the development of cardiovascular disease. Of course, there are more, but I'll challenge you to take three in your head. And finally, I want to really articulate why we need sex differences research, because there's a lot of confusion out there now between sex and gender and political influences and so on. But I want to make sure everybody's in grounded in the biology and the science of why we need to keep this moving forward. So just to remind everybody that the basic biology of sex is based on the sex chromosomes, two X chromosomes for female and an XY chromosome for males. I'm gonna move this off the curve so I can see. And you know, this is the basis, the biological basis of sex, it's genetic. And we can't forget that. But on top of these genetic differences, which dictate the development of the um, uh, sex organs and production of sex chromosomes, or excuse me, sex hormones, we do have the sex hormones produced from cholesterol in both males and females. And both testosterone and estrogen are present in both males and females. And of course, estrogen is aromatized from um, testosterone and the concentrations uh, are different in males and females, increasing with age and decreasing, uh, um, at, increasing at puberty and decreasing with age. But they're, this, they're there just the same. And we have to remember it's the ratio of these sometimes which affects some of the cellular processes. So when we think of cellular physiology, how do we really visualize these effects then? Well, we have this genomic effects of the X and the Y chromosome in the nucleus, which really dictate the functions of the cell, protein synthesis, enzyme production, metabolism, apoptosis, migration and proliferation and so on. But on top of this basic uh, genetic composition, we have the sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen, which do come into the cell and can affect gene transcription. These are genomic effects. But over the years, what we learned by studying the effects of the hormones is that they really have non-genomic effects as well. These are very rapid changes that deal with cellular um, signaling in terms of ion channels and inter, uh, uh, cellular signaling pathways. And these themselves may have, in, have indirect effects on um, the genetics and genomic transcription. And of course, one of the uh, 
issues that we studied and Gabe was interested in as well is the effects of estrogen on nitric oxide. So we have this combination of the genetic effects with the cellular effects. And when you think about physiological regulation, this makes sense. These effects from the genome are really mm -hmm. long lasting, but you have to modify that and tune it with these very rapid changes which may occur in terms of factors in the immediate environment, including things that Gabe um, would study, which would be blood flow and the interaction um, of uh, other cells with the vascular endothelium. So it's on this background then that you can expand the idea of sex differences in health and disease to every system. So we have the basic genetic composition, biological sex, we have hormones, but then we have these two combinations of things influencing the brain, all organ structure, responses to stress, fat distribution, immune responses, a, a key uh, issue related to COVID today, inflammation, homeostasis and water balance, lipid and drug metabolism, regulation of intracellular pathways. I mean, you can't get away from it. It affects every aspect of physiology. Sex matters because of sex specific chromosomes and hormones, there are sex differences in health and disease. So I would challenge you to come up with one condition that does not show some type of sex disparity, either in um, frequency or uh, uh, prevalence or uh, expression of symptoms, response to treatment or morbidity and mortality. And if we think about this in terms of uh, medications, um, we can think about how the hormones really can influence response to drugs. They can uh, compete with transporters. They can interact with receptors. They can interact or uh, modify the enzymatic responses and they can alter gene transcription. So the fact that we need to pay attention to both sex and hormonal status when we consider risk for disease, pre preventive strategies, response to treatment and outcomes is just, is a basic concept that must be put in everybody's mind and taught at the very level of, um, of medical education. When we think about integrated cardiovascular system, and this applies to all the work that was done in the physiology department at, at uh, New York Medical College, influence of the autonomic nervous system, the response of the blood vessels themselves, the interaction of blood elements, platelets and leukocytes with the endothelial wall, and of course, the renin and angiotensin system, which was a system that Gabe had uh, focused on and the work of, of Tom Hensey with the control of the heart. So in terms of sex specific effects of hormonal changes throughout life, I love this picture, which was on the Journal of Applied Physiology uh, back in 2003, when we were trying to get many of these national initiatives uh, brought forward. And I like this picture for several reasons. First of all, it does show the life course across um, of the influence of hormones across the lifespan. And focusing on the, this uh, woman who is pregnant here emphasizes a couple of points. First of all, the physiology of a young person, an old person, and a middle age are not the same. The hormonal effects of the, um, on the woman's body when she's pregnant allows her to bring this fetus to term. And some of those effects are reversible. Whereas we have um, irreversible effects of the sex hormones in terms of the development of the reproductive organs, those responses which occur during pregnancy, some of which are reversible. So when we think about the life course of a woman and risk for cardiovascular disease, we can break it down into um, a couple of phases. One is pregnancy. Another is surgical induced menopause, ophorectomy, and this would be before the age of natural menopause. And of course, the natural menopause and hormone treatments. And so in the time I have today, I wanna to break down some of the information that we have uh, data that we've gathered over the years. And it's a combination to pay attention of how we've used epidemiological data to go to more mechanistic studies through all these phases and actually used information from the basic sciences to design some of the studies to look at the effects of hormones in people. 
So let's look at pregnancy first. With uh, my colleagues at, at Mayo Clinic and uh, Vesna Garavik, who was in the Department of Nephrology and Hypertension with our first specialized center of research excellence on sex differences, we had this epidemiological study where we leveraged the uh, Rochester Epidemiological Product Project, which is a medical link record system to identify women in Olmsted County that either had a normal tensive pregnancy or a hypertensive pregnancy um, from the years 1976 to 1982. And we had very rigorous um, exclusion criteria in terms of trying to eliminate people with pre-existing cardiovascular disease as identified or other diseases in the medical record. <clears throat> we were doing imaging, the cardiovascular system and looking at risk factors, we did brain imaging and cognition. So what were our populations? Well, as you can see, by, we were very good in terms of uh, uh, Vesna and her crew worked very diligently to identify women about the same age. Um, time since the first birth was about 75 years. And what you notice that if you abstract data from the medical record, the women that had a history of preeclampsic pregnancies at the age of 25 years after that first pregnancy had a greater incidence of hypertension. They had higher body mass index, larger waist circumference, and a bit of insulin resistance and inflammation. So considering that when these women were uh, pregnant and, um, and, and eliminating other kinds of cardiovascular diseases at the time we examined them, hypertension is, uh, was a key finding. When we began to image their um, cardiovascular system, we first looked at the coronary arteries, and this is a um, computed tomography of the heart and the person's feet would be coming out at you. So this is the left coronary artery, and you can see this white thing here is a hunk of calcium, not a good thing in the coronary arteries. And when we looked at the presence of the amount of calcium in the coronary arteries between our two groups, indeed we found that the women that had a hypertensive pregnancy, the history of it, had more calcium in their coronary arteries than those who had a normotensive pregnancy. But look at these data, and I think this emphasizes a point for many of us who like to just do bar graphs. The idea that we put the individual data points here really shows us two populations of women within this group. Those who developed a significant amount of coronary calcification, but there's others who did not. So the question that comes from these data is what makes this group different? What makes these women that didn't develop calcium different from these women that did? And this is um, an area for ongoing studies and, and um, investigation to figure out, yeah, you might have a risk for a preeclamptic pregnancy, you may have a risk for increased calcification, but what, what makes these women different? When we image the carotid arteries, and this would be uh, with ultrasound, and this little piece here is the carotid intermedial thickness. Again, we saw that women that had a history of preeclamptic pregnancies had higher or greater amounts of intermedial thickening than those that had a normal tensive pregnancy. And then we measured this with Jill um, Barnes, who was a student in my um, uh, Joiner's laboratory, has gone on to have a very successful career at the University of Wisconsin. We did uh, measurements of hypercapnia, where you, it, women would increase the amount of CO2 breathed in a measured way. We measured the um, cerebral artery blood flow with a, a Doppler at the at, placed about here in the head. And the responses of changes in the cerebral um, blood flow velocity, you can calculate as a slope. And this slope is known as a cerebral vascular activity. When we looked at our two groups again, <clears throat> we saw that the women that had a history of, of um, preeclamptic pregnancies had less of a lower response to the hypercapnic response. Therefore, their cerebral arteries are less responsive to this change in, re in breathing um, uh, uh, carbon dioxide, less reactive. And you must say, well, what does that do in terms of the brain? When we imaged the brain, we found that the women who had current histories of hypertension and a history of preeclamptic um, pregnancy had atrophy in the visual spatial areas of the brain. So we can see this. Does this 
play out into actual a uh, medical or a, a diagnostic issue. And indeed, if you get the, did use a clinical consensus diagnosis of co cognitive status, indeed we found that these women had a cognitive impairment in the visual and spatial function. Now I wanna point out here that we used a clinical consensus diagnosis of cognitive status. This is very different than looking at a battery of tests and looking at the scores and developing a, a Z-score on um, cognitive testing. Because when you use the clinical diagnosis, we found that this was more sensitive when you look at two standard deviations of what these scores would be on the test, which would actually give you a clinical diagnosis of cognitive impairment. So that raises caution when you look at some of these cognitive tests that are used with aging and Alzheimer's study to really question how sensitive they are to be picking up some of these differences where a clinical consensus or a diagnosis of having somebody in front of you and talking to them, it gives you a better sense of what their cognitive ability might be. And this just summarizes the data that which uh, I've shown so far um, we, with uh, Jill uh, Barnes and her graduate student, Catherine, Kathleen Miller, um, the blood pressure increases, the risk for that increases with age as a woman ages. And you will see that more when we talk about natural menopause. Um, but something about having a preeclamptic pregnancy shifts this response so that that um, increases the risk for hypertension, vascular activation, gray matter changes, and cognitive impairment. And one of the things that might be activated is the what we call activated vascular compartment. That is, cells that are activated can release microvesicles, which contain biologically active material, which can form a surface for thrombin, thrombosis, blood clot, and actually affect blood flow to the brain and the heart. And with Muthaval Jayachandra, my long-term colleague, developed a way to measure some of these microvesicles derived from specific cells of the vascular compartment, the blood elements, as well as the endothelium and smooth muscle. And he developed a series of tests where we can measure all these interactions. And in fact, some of the, if I can, let's see if I can go previous, won't let me go back. Um, previous. Okay, so some of these blood elements can contain microvesicles from two different cells. That is that they can contain um, markers from the cell of origin, the platelet, but then they can also pick up cells that um, may markers if they interact with other cells, they can contain two markers of two cells. And that's where we have the platelets that are positive for a leukocyte interaction and so on here. When we analyzed all of these cells, we found that with the coronary calcification, that the procoagulant microvesicles that had tissue factor and those that were derived from leukocytes and endothelium, senescent cells and adipocytes were more associated with coronary calcification. Alternatively, those that were associated with interval medial thickness related more to platelet aggregation and monocytes and granular sites interaction, and not so much senescent cells and adipocytes. And the same held true for the cerebral vascular reactivity. So when we look at causes of the blood cells interacting with the various anatomical features of the cardiovascular system, we can see that there's different forces that may be involved or different parameters that are involved with the pathological processes. So with preeclampsia, we have that there's an increase in metabolic changes, maybe some with insulin resistance. We have increased intravascular activation, which increases coronary risk for coronary calcification, carotid intermedial thickness, and reduces um, cerebral uh, artery reactivity, leading to increased brain atrophy and changes in cognition. So what do we do with this information? We have to change the practice of monitor, monitoring women following hypertensive pregnancies. And fortunately, this is being done at Mayo Clinic. Now, when women come in to the obstetric and gynecology department for um, uh, especially gynecology as they go through menopause, 
they're now referred to um, blood pressures routinely taken and referred to primary care physicians if they're hypertensive. Um, we need to include a pregnancy history and assessing um, long-term chronic diseases, which typically is not there. Um, our medical record has changed. Usually you were asked how many live births you have, but never any complications associated with those births, whether that was um, hypertension, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, or whatever. That is now being included because those are risk factors specific for women. And we need to learn more about the underlying genetic and hormonal factors contributing to the risk for preeclampsia. So there's some ideas for the young people in the audience. So let's talk about surgically induced menopause or oophorectomy before the natural age of menopause. This is an untapped population that most represents what's done in the basic science arena. What do we do in basic science to study the effects of hormones? And I know many of you who are in this audience who have done this, you take an animal and whip out the ovaries, right? Okay, this is your, your comparable group of humans and they're there. And with my colleague, Walter Roca, again, he looked at the um, Rochester Epidemiology Project, identified women that had their ovaries out before the age of 45, um, and then referent matched uh, age and condition matched referent women. And they followed them at 14 years later and used 18 measures of um, accelerated aging and compared them between these two groups. And here are the data. I don't, it's a lot of data here, but all you need to do is look at the red lines in each of these groups and take a quick look. And the red line is always above the black line. What this means is that women who had their ovaries out before the natural age of menopause had increased in multiple areas of uh, chronic diseases of aging, kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, um, uh, depression, anxiety, and dementia, and, the, and even some cancers, okay, where early on these cancers would show up when the fact that some of the removal of the ovaries <clears throat> for benign conditions were to prevent ovarian cancer, but look at the physiological consequences of this procedure. Well, some of these data could be criticized because they weren't adjusted for um, baseline conditions, okay? So when you when Walter and his group went back and actually adjusted for uh, pre-existing conditions and took no pre-existing conditions at baseline, he found that when you looked at this um, number of mean conditions, it still was greater within the first six years. And then it kind of paralleled what would happen with aging. So within these first six years would take somebody up actually to the natural age of menopause. So how could you ameliorate some of these negative effects? Um, and some of them, the survival can be mediated or ameliorated by initiating um, hormonal treatments. And here's the survival curve of women who had um, bilateral oophorectomy before the age of 45 treated with hormones compared to those who were not their survival curves. So we know that oophorectomy with a premature loss of estrogen and other ovarian hormones accelerates aging and leads to increased morbidity and mortality. We don't know and are investigated now some of the genetic variants that influence this trajectory. And those experiments are ongoing with the, um, continued with the study of um, our specialized center of research excellence. And we know that hormone therapy interferes with some of this process but exactly what parts of it and how fast are being investigated now. So finally, let's look at natural menopause and hormone treatments. And actually this was my first foray of uh, stepping into a clinical study from the multiple work that I had done on experimental animals um, and the effects of estrogen. The Cronus Early Estrogen Prevention Study, or KEEPS, um, looked at the effects of hormone treatment on women who were at um, natural age of menopause within three years, six months to three years of their um, last menses. And here is our group. This is 727 people, women from nine clinical centers across the country. 
And when you look at these values for BMI, blood pressure, estradiol, yes, they were all menopausal, their cholesterol, these are really healthy women. And I love this group of women because this is as close to a control group of women that you're gonna get because our inclusion criteria were so, so rigorous in terms of uh, exclusion for existing conditions, medications, and so on. And this group, although these this group was initially recruited in 2004, we're still calling them back and doing studies on them. So we'll have a wonderful profile of aging after menopause in these women. The women were randomized either to placebo or um, a conjugated equine estrogen that was taken orally or an estradiol patch. So just to remind you, when oral medications take a first pass through the liver before getting into the systemic circulation, However, the transdermal products would go through the skin and it goes directly into the circulation, um, bypassing the um, metabolism in the liver. And prior to our, our um, uh, talk, some of us were talking about the effects of uh, hormones uh, and birth control pills on clotting and inflammation. And this is one of the reasons why the, that relationship is so strong with oral uh, hormone products is because of this effect in the liver for clotting and inflammation factors. And let's talk a little bit about the products. The transdermal estrogen with 17 beta estradiol, this is what our bodies naturally produce from the ovaries. The conjugated equine estrogen, the oral product, is really a mixture of metabolites from estrogen. Yes, there's 17 beta estradiol, but the primary product in conjugated equine estrogen, remember, which is going to the liver first, is estrone. Estrone can be converted to estrogen, but it's not the primary substance. So when you talk about hormones and you talk about estrogen, it's very important to be precise in terms of what the um, product is and how it's given. Because when you look at the, um, and I don't have a picture of that, but when you look at the concentrations of these products in the blood. For those women that received the 17 beta estradiol, this was the highest product that you could measure. For the women getting oral conjugated equine estrogen, it was estrone. And these have very different binding affinities for the estrogen receptors. And of course, there's metabolism here from the estrone to estrone sulfate. So the primary outcome of the KEEP study was a progression of atherosclerosis or the development of the um, carotid intimal medial thickening. And you saw this picture before. Here are the data after four years of treatment in our cohort. Okay, what do you see? Do you see a significant influence of treatment here? When we saw, the, you can imagine the investigators, when we saw this, it was completely threw us off because we were expecting to see less of a accumulation in those women that were treated with the hormone products. These are exactly the same. There's no significant difference here. What does this mean? Well, there's two possible um, uh, reasons for these data. One is that these women were very healthy when um, they were recruited. And if you have a healthy profile, these effects weren't gonna be seen until maybe many years later. And remember to accumulate um, intimal medial thickness takes time. Four years may not have been enough for these curves to separate. And we're not really sure of whether the doses of what we gave um, were adequate to really give you an effect. Um, we know our, our treatments were efficacious for menopausal symptoms but you have to keep in mind that the threshold for treatment effects for symptoms may be very different from those that are structural effects on the arteries. We looked at some of the factors that might contribute to changes in CIMIT. And again, we went back with, with Jay, I went back to um, uh, Dr. Jay Chandra, went back to look at our microvesicles and we found that the number of activated microvesicles actually corresponded um, linearly with a direct relationship to the development of the um, uh, hyperplasia 
until medial thickening, um, regardless of what the treatment group was. So there was some vascular activation. It would seem to be driving this response, which took us to say, well, maybe there's an effect of a pharmacogenomic effect that is um, and cardiovascular disease is a complex trait. So what is a pharmacogen pharmacogenomic effect? It is a genetic variant which influences upon which the effect of the treatment would influence, okay? So the genetic variant by itself may cause a, a, a change in the projection of the thickness, but the treatment may impede that in an interesting way. So how do we get at this? Well, we looked at the collective data of changes in cement over time, and this is all groups collapsed together. And what you can see is that the variability of all these groups increases with age. And this is a natural phenomenon. As you get older, the variability in the population widens. Okay, and we did a panel of um, thousands of SNPs. And I'm just gonna show you one of them here for um, interleukin regulatory factor four, which is associated with um, uh, inflammation. And what do we have here? I don't know if you can see, here's the placebo group. Here's the transdermal estrogen group, and here's the oral group. Here are the genetic variants, homozygous, heterozygous, homozygous for the variant. And you can see in the placebo group, it's pretty much the same. But when you look at the treatment groups, and I chose this one for a very specific reason, what you see is depending upon what variant was here, you see a very different trajectory and the effects of the hormones on that expression of that variant. So is it any one, and this is just one, right, of all the SNPs that we looked at. And when you look at all the SNPs and try to come up with some um, effect of the hormones, why did we not see a difference? Is because each, each SNP we looked at, there was a different effect of the hormones on the expression of that variant. So of course we're gonna see variations and in the 12,000 SNPs we looked at, we can come up with some conclusions. Those that were most related to innate immunity were the ones that associated with increases in um, carotid intual medial thickness under the treatment. The second thing is that none of the SNPs that we found at baseline were the same SNPs that we found once the treatment was initiated. In other words, there was a significant interaction of the treatment on the genetic variants on the outcomes that we were going to measure. And I think this has to be kept in mind with everything that we study in terms of the um, genetic predisposition to conditions and the effects of treatments on those. The one that we found, which was a significant positive effect, was when we looked with uh, Dr. Kajal Kantarsi our neuroradiologist, um, part of the um, uh, uh, Alzheimer's Center at Mayo, where we were doing imaging of the amyloid deposition in the brain. And um, a variant in the for the amyloid, the APO epsilon 4 uh, genetic variant increases the risk for Alzheimer's disease in women. So when we looked at this variant compared to the changes in um, amyloid de deposition, we could see that here's the groups with the deposition, the odds ratio, those women that were, that were um, randomized to the estrogen patch had less amyloid in their brains than either those with the oral or the placebo. And if we broke this down to APOE carriers, we see excuse me, this pharmacogenomic effect, that, that, that the women that had the, um, the transdermal estrogen had less, significantly less amyloid in their brains compared to the, um, uh, those that were given the oral compound. And this may affect, be some of the reason why the data from the Women's Health Initiative, which, which used only conjugated equine estrogen saw an increased risk of dementia um, in that trial. And this is to, again, to show the significant difference between these two groups. Well, the non-carriers, this wasn't so much the case, 
Okay, so this genetic variant is really um, influencing the development of amyloid and um, the effects of hormone treatment on it. Now, this initial study was done at, with our Mayo cohort. So we had 118, we had 110 that finished, and we actually had 75 that underwent this imaging. We have now, through um, the KEEPS continuation study, which is funded by NIH, they're now calling back all the KEEPS participants across the country. So we should have data on um, 700 um, women to see if this effect was true. And this was four years after the treatment had stopped. So again, a long-term consequence of a structural change related to hormones. So when we take the summary of the KEEPS data, we can say that menopause causes intravascular activation. Um, the genetic variants modulate the response to hormones and um, which would affect the which would affect cerebral blood flow, which we have measurements. I don't have time to show you all those data today and cognitive health um, and damaged brain tissue as well. Hormones can interfere with this process. So what are their opportunities? Well, we think we're doing, um, my colleagues and I I'll keep using we, I'm not there anymore, <laughs> but I know the studies are ongoing because I keep in touch with them. We're doing uh, genetic uh, testing of women with oophorectomies and knowing what the appropriate dose is for those women and following them long-term to see the consequences. So using a genomic approach to titer hormone treatment, I think is something in the future. We need to expand these studies to look at the type of estrogen with the brain function. And then we really need to do longitudinal studies. Um, we have some of these ongoing at, at Mayo right now through the Specialized Center of Research Excellence, um, the euphorectomy group and the KEEP study. So um, the KEEP study will close in 2023. I think, um, I don't know the close date for the um, uh, euphorectomy study because that got significantly shut down during COVID and we weren't recruiting at all. Those are our data, but I would like to, I hope you see that it's important to consider that these effects in women and hormones affect multiple systems, including the cardiovascular system as we age. But why do we need more generally to sex-based research? Well, you're in a medical school, so you know that research is the driver for education of a cutting edge clinical practice. And pardon the pun since I'm in the department of surgery. A sex-based approach to research is the essence of a holistic approach to patient-centered care, because what is gonna be driving those responses is the biological contributions of the sex hormones plus, or excuse me, the sex chromosomes, in addition to the sex hormones, which are or not there, which change with age. So how do we transform what we need? Well, you need to identify the sex of the cells, you need to identify the sex of the animals, they include females, and their age and their hormonal status. You need to disaggregate data from clinical studies for male and female. We can't just, one size does not fit all. And I'm glad to see that some of the COVID data that's coming out are being disaggregated for men and women. And finally, we need to take those data and apply it actually to individualized care. But when the patient is in front of you, you know, and I asked this when I got my COVID shot, I'm thinking, you know, I'm sitting here, my, you know, five foot two, I'm not going to tell you my weight, but you know, you know, I'm short and fat. So <laughs> compared to the guy that was next to me on the table, you know, which was six foot five and maybe 300 pounds, and we're both getting the same dose of the COVID vaccine. Now, does that make sense to you? Well, maybe from a public health standpoint for first Pass, yes, maybe, but does that make sense to you in terms of other, me other medications that you may be giving or response to treatment for cardiovascular disease, some of which relate to the renin angiotensin system, which Gabe had studied uh, early in his career. So finally, NIH gets the idea that we need to balance the sex of cells for transparency and reproducibility. Um, I, we did a um, study, uh, did a quick, review of the American Journal of Physiology, and I don't have these data here today, but I will be presenting them in my Canon lecture at EB. I'll give you a little 
I'll advertise that for next week <laughs> to, of what we found in terms of how good our journals are in terms of the American Physiology Society. And then I'd just like to um, close with a reminder that we talked today about biology, the biology of sex, the influence of the chromosomes and the hormones and their interactions on all these systems. But we hear a lot about gender and health and disease. And I'd like to add just to clarify the chromosomes and the hormones are biology. Gender is all this other stuff, all right? Lifestyle, uh, diet activity, drug use, sleep, relationships, healthcare. Do you have access to it? How much do you know? Where do you live? You know, the conditions in Minnesota in terms of climate and pollutants are very different from New York City, let's just say, okay? and um, rural areas exposure to um, xenotropic uh, kinds of fertilizers and weed killers and so on, occupational risks, um, culture, your attitudes, whether you wanna take um, attitude, whether you feel that COVID is real or not, or cardiovascular disease is real or not, do you wanna ignore that symptom of chest pain or indigestion that you feel? Um, and would you have the financial resources to really um, uh, get, get to the care that you need? So we have to talk about the intersection of biology and gender, but we should not confuse the two. We need to know what can be controlled and many of these things can be controlled and what can't be controlled and what can't be controlled are your genetics. So in summary, is uh, your test. List three, this factors that contribute to sex differences. Now, if we were in person, I'd call on somebody from the audience, but we're not, <laughs> much to my chagrin. <laughs> but I will tell you, and everybody should say in unison, chromosomes and hormones, okay? Um, and list three processes by which sex influences development of cardiovascular disease. Anybody want to raise their hand or say anything? I'll give you a minute to think about it in your head. And we have direct and indirect effects of the hormones on the genetics. They affect vascular remodeling, vascular responsiveness, permeability, blood flow, go on and on, okay? You probably come up with some others. Autonomic regulation, which many of you were interested in as well. And why do we need sex differences research? It's the best target to preventive diagnostic and treatment strategies to improve the health of all. One size does not fit all. A prevention strategy for somebody who's 15 is not gonna be the same as a prevention strategy for somebody who's 65 or 70. And the risk factors and environmental factors are gonna be very different. So um, I'm gonna leave you with that and give acknowledgement to my colleagues for our original score, which was a specialized center of research on sex differences that have since changed the name to a specialized center of research excellence. Um, Michelle Milkey has taken over that uh, role. Um, Muthaval Jayachandra is our, was our, my microvesicle guru, Vesna Garavik um, and her team were the, or the preeclamptic pregnancy group. Um, Kijal Kantarsi is now director of the Women's Health Research Center. Walter Roca, my long-term uh, colleague, uh, worked with the Rochester Epidemiology Project for the oophorectomy cohort. Kim Jensen was our study coordinator. Jim um, and Julie Fields was our um, uh, uh, clinical uh, psychologist who did all the analysis of the cognitive testings. There's other people here, our statisticians, which um, were key to this part of the experiment. And uh, Shushant Ramadanian was worked with Joel Barnes to do the cerebral vascular um, studies. So without their help, um, none of this would have happened. And so I thank them and thank you for your attention today and carry forward, sex is important. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller, for an interesting, engaging, and uh, very relevant uh, 
research presentation. I really appreciate it. That's fantastic. We have a short question and answer period now. I think Dr. Bellany, did you want to run this? And uh, I know that I see a couple of, or at least one question in the chat, and then there are others here. And then we'll have the award uh, ceremony. Frank, you're muted. Okay, yes. So put your questions in the chat and I will call on you. So uh, uh, Dr. Kohler, you had a question. Would you like to ask it? You have to unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, oh, my question is that, you know, over the counter you can buy many compounds which is, you know, supposed to be supporting estrogen. Mm -hmm. Should women buy those things? This is the first question. And the second one, when you have a estrogen replacement therapy, should you include progesterone as well? Yeah, um, those are both really good questions. Yeah, there's a lot of um, interest in over-the-counter products and alternative health medicine, especially to relieve symptoms of menopause. Many of this, and there was a lot of interest in black cohosh for a long time. Many of the studies that have been done with a lot of those pro, uh, products do not necessarily show that they're efficacious. Um, red rice contains a lot of estrogen, and that probably would be um, uh, uh, something that would be an estrogen-like compound. In fact, for our KEEPS trial, women were excluded if they were using that product, or if they were using that product, they had to stop it for six months, I think, before they, they came into it. But again, you have to think about these um, products in terms of their long-term and short-term effects on things that we would want to study. Structural things are long-term effects. So stopping a medication, you know, is not going to necessarily reverse what's happened before. It would stop the immediate sort of um, uh, non-genomic effects of the, of, the, of the product. In terms of the progestin, you know, there's not a lot of work with progesterone alone on the cardiovascular system or the interactions. We did some work early on um, that shows that the progesterone, progesterone, progesterone will interfere with some of the processes of estrogen. At gen genetic level, because they share co-regulators in terms of genomic regulation. Now the main culprit is to think about what the progestin is. Is it a natural progesterone or is it a synthetic one? And the big bugaboo from the Women's Health Initiative was that they use medroxyprogesterone acetate, which is a synthetic progestin, which does bind to other steroid hormone or receptors. And this was what was found to really increase the risk of breast cancer in that clinical study. So progesterone is usually used for women that have a uterus and going through menopause and taking hormone treatments but it is now not, it's the natural progesterone, which would be a micronized progesterone um, taken orally. It's in peanut oil. So women who have allergies to peanut oil or peanuts uh, are discouraged from that particular product. But and in some studies indicate that progesterone does do have significant effects for sleep. So it's a hormone that's understudied um, you have to be careful, like with estrogens, to the terminology and formulation and mode of delivery is important to consider. Uh, Dr. Kelly had a question, Harriet. You're, you're, you're muted, Harriet. Mine is so off the chart, I think I'd like to save it for last and let the more informed people get their questions in first, okay? Okay, Dr. Leonard, did you, Chris, did you have a question? Sure, I'm not sure my question is any more informed, but uh, I was curious about your your data on the, uh, um, on, uh, the uh, APO, uh, APOE mutation, mm -hmm. right, the uh, e, the epsilon mutation. And I was curious, how does the data that you showed, which was really interesting to see how it's sorted out based on uh, genotype, how does that compare to males that uh, that have been have been tracked? Um, do, do the numbers uh, look worse or better you know, overall? Maybe there are other interacting genetic factors, for example. Well, men that men that have the ApoE um, genotype 
do have uh, increased risk for uh, beta amyloid deposition, but for women, it's a greater risk. And the data that was done out of the Rochester study of aging, um, Kajal Kantarsi is an author on that paper, but um, Cliff Jack is the, um, uh, Clifford Jack is the senior, I think either senior author or the first author, which shows those um, significant um, uh, risk for women compared to men with that particular genotype. But that study in the initial um, study of aging was not sorted for the women relative to their hormonal status. It was just women compared to men with the genotype and the genotype increased the risk more in women than men. I see, I see, interesting. And was there also, did you ever sort out the, the differences with uh, say uh, cholesterol metabolism or cardiovascular function with those uh, women that had the genotype and didn't, and then were treated with hormone? Uh, the, from the KEEP study, those women did not have any cardiovascular disease. I mean, there we 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 screened them to get into keeps. You had to have a um, a um, uh, coronary calcification score less than fifty, and the only thing that let you into the study in terms of cardiovascular disease was clinically treated hypertension. So none of them had um, uh, none of them were taking lipids, uh, lipid lowering drugs or anything like that. Um, uh, that's why I love that cohort, because you can sort of eliminate some of these other factors, metabolic factors that you would consider would be contributing to cardiovascular disease that would contribute to brain health as well. Right. Great. Thank you. Dr. Chander, uh, Dr. Praveen Chander had a question. Yeah. Hi. Um, excellent talk. Uh, what I would like to know is if there's any data on women that undergo premature menopause, like late 30s, early 40s, I know of a few cases. And in these cases, do you recommend replacement hormonal therapy? And if so, of what type? Mm -hmm. Yes, there are studies that have looked at women with premature menopause and menopause caused by other, um, uh, I should say, menses irregularities caused by eating disorders or excessive exercise and so on. And those women do have accelerated aging. I'm not a physician, so I can't make any kind of recommendations about treatment, okay? But all I can say is from the data that we have shown from our oophorectomy cohort and the studies that have been done on these um, uh, uh, studies with women with irregularities in their menstrual cycles that hormone replacement does um, affect, uh, reduce the, the risk of these chronic conditions. So it's now um, recommended clinical practice for women, especially with bilateral oophorectomy and probably with premature menopause too, to stay on hormone treatment until the natural age of menopause and then it can be titered off. Many people would want to continue it, but that is, I mean, I can only can speak for what I know here at Mayo Clinic because those are the clinical colleagues I interacted with in, in the Women's Health Center and in, in, um, the, in the gynecology department. Our, our standard of care is to keep them on treatment until the natural age of menopause. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Harriet, do you want to ask your question now? There's, there's uh, nobody else. Okay. In Everybody seat. else is, is asked out. I, I actually have one question. Oh, okay. uh, I didn't sure. type it in. Dr. Zucker? The Virgi yeah, Virginia, very nice talk. I enjoyed it. Um, so uh, in, the, in the cohort, in this bimodal distribution in the preeclamptic women for calcium mm -hmm. scores, mm -hmm. um, ha have you looked, do they uh, separate based on uh, either socioeconomic status or education? No, uh, no, um, our, our group in our group in Rochester in terms of um, socioeconomic status was not um, with only 40 women, it wasn't broad enough to bring that up. But when we look at that relative to some of the metabolic parameters, okay, that's where it sort of sorts out. So if, and I didn't, I. Um, didn't think to include this slide as a backup one, but we at one point had looked at the calcification and corrected the incidence for um, uh, BMI 
for hypertension um, and insulin resistance. And when we corrected for that, the difference was gone. So I think that some of those differences are not socioeconomic status, which may affect their BMI and their metabolism. Yeah. But in terms of the physiology, it would be related to the metabolic parameters of insulin resistance and, and plus the um, lipids. Right, thanks. And how, so let me follow up with that. How do, how, do you, how do you sort those conditions uh, they might have occurred uh, independent of of the, their pregnancy history. You know. The, yeah, the that's that's okay. So I, I see. So this is what makes it tough. So when you want to look at what really is a predisposition for preeclampsia, you have to know what the woman's health is before she gets pregnant, right? Exactly, yes. Okay, and sometimes they don't show up into the doctor until they want to get pregnant or they are pregnant. Okay, so Vesna's group has identified that women that are obese prior to their pregnancy are at increased risk um, and have metabol what would be called metabolic syndrome prior to their pregnancy or at increased risk for preeclampsia and gestational diabetes, which makes sense, right? Now, we didn't have, we had to use in our statistical modeling, we had, a, we didn't have pre-pregnancy records. We just had what their first visit to the doctor would have been, which would have probably been at three months, right? Prior to, or, you know, within the first three months of pregnancy when they first, you know, the, know they're pregnant and they come in. Right. So we use those data for their baseline BMI, which is not the best, but it's the best we could do. And then we looked at the um, uh, uh, values when they were in the study. And because we used the uh, medical record, it's possible to um, go back and look at what medications that they may have been on um, in the meantime. Unlike the KEEP study, the, the in entry into the um, uh, preeclampsia studies, we included, excluded people that had ongoing cardiovascular disease and inflammatory or uh, uh, immune functions, but um, other medications we, we, we collected and we could um, take that into the statistical analysis. Is that what you were asking, Frank? Yeah, so you, you did have some, uh, some health records from at least from, from their pregnancy time, at least. Maybe. Absolutely. From the time that they come in, once you come in to Mayo Clinic and you get a Mayo Clinic number, you're in the system forever. All right. So you have that they have to make that first entry point. And even if they went to the surrounding hospitals, the, uh, the rep, the Rochester Epidemiology Project takes into some of the other clinics, the Olmsted County Clinic and so on, uh, hospital system, our, our, our records are, um, are, are accessible. It's a very rich resource. And the thing that needs to be, uh, what I would like to see done, and I, uh, Jill Barnes at Wisconsin and I, and, and even some of the people here, the cardiologists, is that when, we don't, those women that were on antihypertensive medications that were in our group, what we had trouble figuring out, what needs to be gone back and look at is when did their hypertension develop relative to that preeclamptic pregnancy? Yeah. Okay. And that's even going to be hard because if they went in for a general practitioner or got referred from somebody, we don't know how long they had that hypertension before they actually were treated. And what sure. is the duration of the treatment time relative to some of these other parameters? Mm -hmm. So I think what needs to be done is a longitudinal study on a group of women that have pre had a preeclamptic pregnancy and to be followed sequentially every three or five years to mm -hmm. really see when that hypertension takes off. And mm -hmm. when it starts to take off, treat those women, this is, you know, who's gonna do this study? Who's gonna fund it, right? right. The ones that is, um, their blood pressure starts to, if they're treated right away and then followed, are their projections for at least the cardiovascular disease different, you know, by the time they're 70. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Like I say, yeah. good luck getting that funded by somebody. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Uh, Harriet, uh, I don't have any other questions. Uh, so go ahead. Well, 
you know, I think we've known from the from what's going on in the culture that there's been a lot more going on about being female than we acknowledged for for centuries. But this adds a level of complexity that I I must admit I had never really considered. And my mind is boggling right now. My question is related to my coming from a different field, non, not from mm -hmm. physiology, clinical psychology, psychoanalytic practice. I'm concerned about trans women, a trans, yeah, trans women. I'm mm -hmm. concerned about the implications of what you've been talking about for those people who transition from being male to being female, primarily as I understand it, by taking estrogens. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've worried to myself, and I've never articulated this question, what happens to these people when they reach the age when women would ordinarily reach menopause? Can they stop taking these? Do they have to, what, could you comment as generally as you can on the implications of your research for treating trans women? Mm -hmm. I, thank you very much for that question. And I'm glad, I'm glad it came from you because you have that perspective from dealing with the clinical aspects of gender dysphoria. Um, That's very kind of you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and you know, we have a gender, um, uh, transgender clinic here at Mayo, and these questions that you're asking, I have asked my colleagues who actually treat these individuals, because, you know, again, the basic biology, you still have those sex chromosomes. And so when you talk about the transition with these hormones, I mean, they're giving bucket loads of estrogen to individuals with XY composition that you would never clinically prescribe for an XX woman and who the public health service says it increases the risk of cancer, blood clots, I mean, you know, everything. So what I'm, con I'm concerned as well, we don't, and I will say, we don't know the long-term consequences. For a long time, trans individuals weren't coming forward and being parts of clinical studies, but I think that they need to be and they need to be in separate studies compared to um, biological, uh, I don't know what the, I don't know the politically correct words are now, because the questions that you're asking are, are, are medically relevant questions in terms of their long-term risk for disease. And it is, we don't know the answer to it, okay? I mean, and you're not gonna be able, you can do some of those experiments with animals, okay? But you're not gonna be able to, get the comp, because transgender individuals, what makes it even harder is that how they transition is not all the same. They don't all start at the same age and some of them have pre-existing conditions, okay? Um, one of my surgical colleagues was asking me a question about he had a, um, a biological man that wanted to transition surgically to be a woman and he was 70 and I'm thinking, oh, he's got pre-existing cardiovascular disease and you're gonna give him hormones and you're doing this and that. And they said, it doesn't matter. So they have to sign, the individuals have to sign a um, release that if they have a bad event, that the physicians are, are clear. What do you do with somebody who transitions at not 70, but at 50 or 20 when these hormones, especially I think with these young people that want to transition before, you know, during puberty, I mean, estrogen closes the epiphysis. Estrogen affects and testosterone affects how the brain develops. I mean, how, how, what is happening to those individuals? To me, it's a human experiment that I, I struggle to say, are we doing an ethical thing, a medical ethical thing and doing no harm, even though the psychological outcomes for these individuals are good. I don't know the answer to your question. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, that's what I would love to discuss this with you more because you see it from the, psych, the, the important psychological consequences of it. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the, the word is cisgender for people who were born into 
the, the gender that they identify as. Um, I, I certainly wish that I could imagine that there was ongoing research being set up because this is a, a, a cultural trend mm -hmm. that's, that's not going away anytime no. soon. Mm -hmm. And no, it's, it's not going to go away. And for individuals that I think there needs to be a lot of education, you know, if you're doing a large clinical trial and you have trans individuals in there and how are they going to, how, how is that going to affect your outcomes? And there's not going to be a lot of them to be statistically, you know, but they might be an outlier in terms of response to drugs because of the hormone drug interactions. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, and I don't mean to be, I want, I, I'm coming for these questions from a scientific perspective because I don't know the answers to them in terms of what, how these things are interacting biologically. And I think they're legitimate questions that need to be asked by the medical community. And I don't know that they will be because they're politically incorrect. Um, can I ask another question? Who are doing it. The people who are asking for these treatments usually are so eager for them that they would override so judgment. Yep. But yep. you know, certainly need to know more about the long-term effects. Absolutely. Um, can I ask a question, Dr. Bannon? Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Chandra has a follow-up to her question, and that'll be the last the last question. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I uh, was kind of afraid to ask this question because I felt maybe I'm the only one stumped with the complexity of the hormones and where they are derived from and so on. So I learned about it in one of the cardiovascular conferences when we were doing experiments on oophorectomy in um, hypertensive rats. And uh, at that time, I learned that if you get estrogen from the horse's urine, it's very different from this, that, and the other. And you did um, mention that. But I missed out when you were talking about the derma patch, that it's a hormone closer to the natural and it goes straight into the systemic circulation versus the equine type, which goes through the liver, of course, and it's not the natural type. Um, could you please clarify that for me again? I, I didn't catch you at that time, sorry. Right, the transdermal patches are 17 beta estradiol. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, so that is the natural hormone, which is most prevalent, the highest concentration in premenopausal mm -hmm. women, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the oral conjugated equine estrogen, and even the oral, there's oral estrogen uh, formulations which have been used. And mm -hmm. Howard Hodes uses those a lot in his studies. And it was showed that the oral estrogen, the 17 beta estradiol, does reduce development of carotid intermedial thickness in women that have um, high um, uh, lipids, okay? So those treatments going through the liver, 17 beta extradiol orally are very effective on a lipid profile and carotid intermedial thickness. The conjugated equine estrogen contains a lot of metabolites. I forget how many, mm -hmm. over 40, okay? Mm -hmm. And those are gonna be metabolized in the liver and circulate. And clearly, I, I wish I would have put that slide in that the highest concentration um, in the blood of the women on the oral patch or the oral um, formulation was estrone and estrone sulfate. 17 beta estradiol was very low. So we don't, to me, I don't expect the outcomes to be the same um, with direct comparisons. And we need to know more whether the dose is adequate. Clearly the epidemiological studies that, that where women used um, oral conjugate equine estrogen for years, those, all those epidemiological studies show that there was a decrease in cardiovascular mortality, all of them. Okay. And um, so it is effective, but that dose was also higher than what we used in the KEEPS. It was 0 0.625 milligrams per day. Where we, when that was what was used in the Women's Health Initiative, and I didn't put any data in my presentation today 
regarding that because well, due to time and complications and so on. But um, uh, uh, and mo on, uh, most of the observational studies and epidemiology studies where women were using that particular compound. After the WHI was stopped in 2002, the recommendation was for the lowest dose of estrogen for the shortest period of time. KEEPS was being designed in 2003 and 2004. I was the only PhD on that panel um, of investigators. All the other ones were MDs and they were all adamant that we had to use a lower dose of estrogen, which we use for, um, uh, we used a standard clinical dose for the patch, but for the oral conjugated equine estrogen, we use 0 0.425 milligrams per day. So it was a lower dose. And that was driven by physicians, okay? Not by basic science. So we would say, if you're gonna compare the studies, you gotta use the same dose. Right. Uh, that experience taught me a lot <laughs> in terms of <laughs> experimental design by clinicians compared to basic scientists and so on. But that's another topic for if we were if we could go out for a beer after the talk, that would be something we could talk about. <laughs> Zoom doesn't let us do that. <laughs> A glass of wine. <laughs> or wine, whatever your favorite <laughs> beverage might be. Okay. Thank you. Well, Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. So, well, let, let's let's end that here. Uh, I want to uh, thank Virginia for a very uh, interest, interesting and, and informative and very timely talk and, and, and for the wonderful work you've done in this area. And um, so we have a round of virtual applause <laughs> for, for, your, for your talk. Thank you very much. Um, and we, uh, we're going to have uh, a brief award uh, award now. You, you get uh, uh, a little plaque for, for giving your talk. And there will be a, okay, a short session afterwards. If anybody has any additional questions for Dr. Miller, you can, you can join that uh, after this uh, ceremony. So I'm going to turn it over now to Mike Wollen, who's the... Uh, the, the chair of the, uh, the Kelly Lecture Committee uh, to make this presentation. Well, thank you. Mike. Virginia, I wanna thank you for giving probably the most meaningful lecture on gender that I've ever heard. And, and, and I think it may have a potential big impact on people designing their future papers and grants uh, uh, in the audience. Um, I have the honor of uh, awarding you the the um, the plaque, which I think we may have a picture of, Marcella. Yeah, there we have a plaque. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, the thing we can't do is give it to you in person, but okay. what we okay. can't do is <laughs> have everyone see it. You know, when you give it to someone in person, they can't really see it. So this is this is the plaque that um, we have in hand to give you. Um, oh, very nice. And we'll get you as soon as we can. Um, 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 uh, you, you, the, the, the next step for you in a week is the Cannon Lecture, which is the most respected lectureship in the American Physiological Society. I'm hoping that you're, by unexpected timing of this, that maybe this is, this is a warm up for that uh, lecture. Um, and um, it's, it's really been a, a pleasure and honor to have you. Um, and, and we've got a more diverse audience as a result of actually having this online too. So yeah. thank you very okay. much, Virginia, for a really wonderful lecture. Well, thank you. It's been it's my pleasure to be here. I just uh, loved interacting with the group over the years, and it's been a real honor. And I must say, I've worked very hard on my Canon lecture, and it's different from today. So you'll see some of the same data, but not, you know, it's hard to... I you know some of you have already been given the Canon Award. I think Irv, you've you've received it, didn't you? No, okay. Well, you know they tell you what it has to be: homeostasis, physiology, control, and you know your career. Well, you know I started graduate school in 1970. How do you put 50 years into a 50-minute talk? <laughs> One, one, I did my best, so uh, it'll be a little. Uh, hopefully, it'll be a little bit fun, and but it's different from today. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. And uh, if you would like to speak to um, Dr. Miller, uh, there's an opportunity in our little breakout rooms. Um, and, and if you'd like to speak to Dr. Cayley, there will be opportunities for that. Please enter that your interest in the chat and uh, please join us there. And if not, 
first tune in to Dr. Miller's Canon Award Lecture next week. And if you can't do that, come back and see us next year with the eighth annual Kaylee Award. And we'll try to recruit suggestions for next year's uh, lecture from you next year. Yes. So, so what do I need to do? Help me, give me some electronic guidance here. Yes. Yeah, so I just stay, just stay where I am? Just stay where you are. We will okay. teleport you. <laughs> it's all teleportion. Teleportation. Oh, thank you, Marcello. And thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you. So if you want to join uh, the meeting, you can stay on. Dr. Ra Dr. Kali, you can uh, join. Uh, there is a, ro a breakout room for you. I would just like to introduce our son, David, who yes. joined. Oh. Unfortunately, after my, my remarks, but he's here. From yeah, London. you've seen that. Uh, so uh, now if you there would be uh, many people in the, uh, in the breakout room for your family. So you can join that room there, David and uh, Dr. Kali. And uh, um, thank you uh, much. You can have some chat in there. Thank you. So you need thank you, to, everyone. This you need to accept uh, the invitation to join the room. Can you see it? Okay, for everybody else that is on the meeting, if you would like to join some of the room here, uh, just let me know. Sharata, you are here? Yeah, you are muted. Yes, I'm waiting for your instructions. Yeah, and for uh, the person here, Praveen, if you would like to join, uh, uh, I can put you in touch with Dr. Miller if you want to join Dr. Miller. Uh, yes, hello. I'm Eleonora, yes. Marcelo, oh. I'm, I'm just... Um, uh, renal pathologist interested in clinical stuff. And I did do some work on the hormone, but I don't know that I have any more intelligent questions left. So, and, and I have to yeah, leave early. So I don't want to be rude. I think it's best if I don't join, but please thank her from my side. She was so patient and responding. So okay. Well. Thank you very much for joining us in this event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank yes. <laughs> I think Elinora wants to go into the room. That is Yes, yes. Hey, uh, uh, I, how are you doing, Eleonora? No, no, I'm fine, but I, I cannot understand uh, where is the room, I mean, uh, I don't... Ah, I can, uh, uh, you know, those are two rooms. If you can join, want to join the room with Dr. Miller, I can move you there. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. So, um, let me... Move you down. Be patient, Eleonora. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Okay, you are. You know, you can feel free to leave uh, whenever you want. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Because okay. also Thank soon you. people will, uh, I think, close. So I'll move you there. You will have okay. to accept. Okay. The... okay. Thank you very much, Marcello. Okay. Bye. Bye. Sharata. Uh, then maybe I will move you somewhere because just to check. Uh, I think you have the ability then to move back. Uh, uh, maybe you want to join the room of Dr. Miller just to check if everything is okay in there. Yeah, sure. And ah, here there is Ma Maggie. Uh, can you hear me? Maggie, I can. Not. I can join there.
So Sharat, I'll try to move you there, okay? Then you can come back uh, whenever you want. Hi, Carol. You are muted. Harriet left. She had to go to work. Uh, repeat that. Harriet had uh, patience. She just ended. Ah, OK, OK. She had to go back to work. So uh, how is the situation? Everybody's coming back then. OK. I, everybody's going to come back now. OK, <laughs> that's good. Is that David, you had the chance to see David as well? Uh, yes. Okay, that it was good. Uh, we, we saw him joining the, the meeting, um, the seminar. Uh, so so how, how did you like it? It was good, actually. I thought it was very good. I mean, considering we're doing everything from Zoom, it worked out well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't know. I don't know if everybody's back coming in? back here or if people are just leaving. I don't know. What did you, how did you came back here? It just transported me here. Ah. You didn't click anything. Let me I didn't see. click anything. So maybe I can bring back. Because uh, um, there's people coming up. You can see on the gallery. Unless I leave, maybe I should, if I leave, maybe I would get out of it. See people, there's Harriet now. So. Yeah, it's doing whatever. Are you still muted, uh, Harriet? Uh, 